Good afternoon again. Welcome again to Blackpool Tabernacle Church. And as we come back to Psalm 73 and verse 26, we look forward to looking looking together at this wonderful verse and this wonderful psalm. But before we do, we'll ask God to bless it. Let's pray. Let's pray. Lord, again, we come to your word. Help us to come, Lord, uh, this afternoon with faith, believing. And if we come believing, we shall receive. Your word says, ask and it shall be given. Seek and you shall find. Lord, we ask today that you would open our eyes afresh to see the wonders of this verse. 
And that we may be able to be brought to a place where we can say the same things as this man did. For your glory we ask it. Amen. Amen. Well, let's come back to Psalm 73. Then verse 26, let me read you the text. Do you remember we saw this morning, my flesh and my heart fail. And we saw it's a reference both to the physical and to the spiritual. Our flesh will fail, death is certain, and our sinful flesh is bound to fail. No one can escape that. No one can escape death, and no one can escape the spiritual failure as well. The aim of the gospel is to get us ready for death, and to see that our sinful nature, our sinful hearts, the centre of man, well, we need a saviour. This man has come to realise it, he nearly lost his faith, he just realises that his flesh and his heart will always fail in that sense. And he comes to a position to see his utter weakness and dependence entirely upon the Lord. That's the key. He faces it. He understands it's not a morbid subject. It's a glorious one. And he has come to understand, we saw, that those who die without God, without Christ, die without hope. That's why we need a saviour, of course, and a salvation. My flesh and my heart fail. Then he says, but God, here's the message this afternoon, God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. What marvellous words. Now notice those two little words. Let's come back to them. He begins with, but God. I think there's a connection there, isn't there? It's a connecting phrase. What words they are. The Bible uses them a lot. But God is used in Ephesians 2. He paints this terrible picture of man's weakness. Well, not weakness. Total inability. Dead in sin. It's all hopeless. It's impossible. And then he says, but God. But God, there's hope. There is a gospel. There is a way of salvation. It's the same in Romans 3. When he says that all the world is guilty before God. Man is weak through the flesh. He cannot keep God's law. He's a sinner. Ah, but just a minute, he says. But now there is a way. The righteousness of God has been revealed. The gospel he's not ashamed of. It points uh, to the gospel by, by showing us and revealing us the, the terrible weakness of man. It points to the hopeless of man, the inability of man, total inability is the Bible's doctrine. We can do nothing. It's a hopeless picture, yes, it's a, it's a terribly hopeless picture. Man is just flesh, it will fail. Man is unable to do it, man can't keep God's law. Man has broken God's law. Man is a sinner, he is dead in trespasses and sin. And then he says, but hang on a minute. But God, but God, there is me, that's what I am, but God, what a contrast, is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. In other words, with man it's impossible, with God the Bible says nothing is impossible. We are too weak, we are weak to do it. We cannot do it, but God is our strength. God is our hope in the gospel. Thank God for that today. Thank God for those two words that begin the text. But God. The Christian gospel is not God calling man to do something. No, no. He can't. He's weak through his flesh. He's unable. So the gospel is but God is our strength. God is our portion, our hope forever. He must do it. That's the point. He must do it. It's his power and his strength, not ours. Isaiah says his own arm brought salvation for him. What the law could not do. We saw it this morning. That was weak through the flesh. Romans 8 verse 3. The gospel is an action uh, by God. It is the action of God from beginning to end. God's power, God's work entirely. By the way, that is how you recognise the false gospels, the false teachings. How do we recognise them? Well, they always add man's works. Man's works are added to God's works. Yes, we've got God's works. Yes, we believe in that. But we add our works to that. 
for salvation. The Bible is very, very categorical on this. It is God's work, God's work entirely. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. Are there works in the Bible? Good works? There are. We're saved to good works, but not by good works. We're to live a life uh, well-pleasing to God as Christians. Yes, a changed life, but that doesn't save us. Oh, it's not of works. Lest anyone would boast. It's entirely God because man is put in a position where he must understand he can do nothing. He cannot contribute to this at all. It's a glorious truth. And this man has seen it, he's got it, and he can declare it. My flesh and my heart fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. What a glorious position he's in. Now this is where we want to be. I've said it all along. This is where we want to be. This man has come to a, a place, what we would call theologically, a full assurance of faith. Remember, he went through a trial and difficulty and he came out the other end stronger for it. He came out with a, a strong faith. He nearly lost his faith. Now his faith is brilliant. Oh, it is possible to be a Christian and not have a full assurance of faith. I do believe that. But God wants you to have a full assurance of faith. To be able to say, God is my strength. God is my portion forever. Isn't that marvellous? His portion, his... He's telling us God is his satisfaction. God is everything. There is no one I desire upon earth besides you. No one in heaven. He is everything. There's nothing more he declares I need. I don't need anything else. Wesley said it in one of his hymns. Thou, O Christ, art all I want. All in thee. Oh, I don't need anything else. All in thee I find. Nothing else. More than all in thee I find. What do I need more than Christ? What do I need more than him? God, he says, is all I need. That's what this text is saying. And what is so important now as we come to examine this verse is the, the truth of this has affected him. It's the results of this truth. So this is not a theological statement. This is not a, a head knowledge. This is not a man confessing a, a confession of faith. Uh, this is a man who's declaring that he has something now. He can say something real. He can say, God is the strength of my heart. Can you see? That's not just a, a, a words. That's experience. It's a spiritual knowledge that God has given him. It's the result of this knowledge, this deep knowledge of God and of the gospel, that he now has come to a place of peace and rest and assurance. It's not just believing the gospel. No, no. He's resting in the gospel. He's not just resting in it. He's boasting in it, isn't he? Like the Apostle Paul. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. I know it's power. Oh, God is my strength. I know it's power. And he's at peace in it. That's the beautiful thing. He is, he is resting in it and he is confidently resting in God and trusting in his Saviour and in the Gospel. And notice how he speaks of it. He said, God is my portion forever. Isn't that marvellous? There is just no end to it, he said. There's just no end to it. He knows not just that God is an eternal and everlasting God, but his love is an eternal and everlasting love. What an assurance this man has. It's a glorious assurance. Uh, he says, like Jeremiah, I have loved you with an everlasting love. God has spoken that into his soul. And with loving kindness I have drawn you. Jesus said, as the Father loved me, so have I loved you. Loved with everlasting love. Led by grace that love to know. Well, the Spirit has done that. He has revealed it from heaven. Oh, listen, who, who can separate me, says Paul in Romans 8, who can separate me from the love of God in Christ Jesus? Who can separate me from that? My name from the palm of his hands, eternity will not erase. So you see, this is full assurance. He's resting in it. Now these words are marvellous. He says, my flesh and my heart failed. 
but God is the strength of my heart. Now that word strength we have translated in our English Bible, strength, is the word in the Hebrew for rock. The word should be rock there. So he's really saying this, but God is the rock of my heart. How about that? The rock of my heart and my portion forever is already referred to it, hinted at it in verses 21 and 22. Thus my heart was grieved and was vexed in my mind. I was foolish and I was ignorant. Remember it? I was like a beast. Nevertheless, I am continually with you and you hold me by your right hand. You hold me. He was aware that God was holding him all the time. But he'd come to see it. You remember his problem again? I remind you of it. He said, as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. I'd almost stumbled. My, my, my feet had almost slipped. My steps had nearly slipped. Stumbled, remember, literally means fallen away completely, entirely. Very nearly fallen away altogether. Very nearly given up on God altogether. No, no, he hasn't. Why not? Well, he's come to see it because God is holding him. God was keeping him. And we saw it. We've mentioned it already. Now unto him who is able to keep you from stumbling, from falling. It doesn't mean he'll keep you from falling into sin. It means he'll keep you from falling away entirely and turning your back on God. He has realised his glorious position. And it's a marvellous truth. That nothing for the believer now can separate him from the love of God in Jesus Christ. He's telling us he's come to a place where he now knows this. He now rests in this. He's now enjoying this. No matter what happens to him. This is his testimony. Even if all the foundations of the world collapse around him. Even if everything is shaking and the whole fabric of, of the world is collapsing around him. It doesn't matter. To him, he can say, my, my flesh and my heart will fail. Oh yes, but God is the strength of my heart. Men's hearts may be failing them for fear, but no, no, not me. For God is the strength of my heart. He's the rock of my heart. He is steadfast. He is certain. He's unmovable, this guy. He cannot be moved. He cannot be shaken. That's a full assurance of salvation. God is his rock, a rock that cannot, is impossible to move. Oh, there are many examples in the Bible of this teaching, of the Old Testament saints that had it, of the New Testament saints that had it. It didn't matter what they were going through, they just had it, they knew it. My favourite in the Psalms, uh, I've quoted it many times, is Psalm 46. Do you remember how he begins? The Psalm, the setting of Psalm is a terrible time of cataclysmic world chaos. Disaster all around, and yet he says, God is our refuge and strength. How about that? Refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Ah, oh, these are troubled days, are they not? Well, God is a very present help in trouble. Listen, therefore, therefore, we will not fear. Isn't that marvellous? Look at verse 7. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. God is with us and for us. And if God is with us and for us, who or what can be against us? Oh, he says in verse 10, Be still, says God, and know that I am God. Do you know that he's God? Oh, listen, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. There's the assurance. There's the confidence. Let me quote another, Psalm 18. Listen to, to, to Psalm 18. The Psalms are, are absolutely rammed with this teaching. I mean, it's just, it's everywhere. But let me, let me quote Psalm 18. Psalm 18 and verse 1. You can read it in many of the Psalms, this, so I could, I could quote many, but let me just quote Psalm 18. He says, I will, I, I will love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, and listen to this, and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength in whom I will trust. Isn't that fantastic? My shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I will call upon the Lord, who is worthy to be praised. So, says David, shall I be saved from my enemies. 
The Lord is my rock. He's my strength. He's my shield. Brilliant. Marvellous, isn't it? To be able to say that. Now you have this in the New Testament. Let me give you an example of it in the New Testament. Do you remember the Gospel of Matthew chapter 16? I've always taught the Gospel is divided into two. The first part is Jesus as the Son of God. The second part is why he came. The moment Jesus has, uh, has got them to see who he is, that he's the Son of God, he then moves on to tell them about how, why he came, to die on the cross. From that moment, he begins to tell them why he came, that he must suffer and die and rise again. But the confession of Peter in Matthew 16 is the thing Jesus was looking for. Do you remember he said he took them to Caesarea Philippi in that place and said, Now who do men say that I am? Some say you're John the Baptist. Some say you're Elijah, come back from the dead. But who do you say that I am? And Peter's confession. Oh, listen to what Peter says. Peter answered verse 16 and said, You are the Christ. I know you are. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said to, said to him, Blessed are you, Simon bar Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now the Roman Catholic Church have taught that here is Peter the the church is built on the, the first bishop of Rome, Peter. Upon that, uh, it traces its lineage back to him. The popes go back to him. He's not the first bishop of Rome. He's not the first pope. He never was a pope. But it's the idea of it being built on him is nonsense. This is not what Jesus is saying at all. Jesus is saying something about a rock here. And the rock that is built, the church is built upon is not Peter. Let me, let me give it you as our Lord said it. Jesus said, you are Peter, Petros in the Greek, Petros, the stone. You are the stone, the person of Peter. You are Peter, the Petros, the stone. He renamed him Peter, didn't he? But on this Petra rock, I will build my church. Not on Peter, not on Petros the stone, but on Petra the rock. And what's the rock? On Peter's confession of who Jesus is. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. On this confession, I will build my church. On the confession, on the impregnable foundation of who Jesus Christ is, that he's the son of God. You take away the deity of Christ. If Jesus isn't God, there is no church. There is no Christianity. Because the gospel in the church is built on him. In other words, Jesus is the, is the, is the Petra, the rock. It's Jesus. Jesus talked about this in other ways. Do you remember in the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew 7, he talked about the man, the true believer, who builds his house upon the rock, upon the true foundation. He built his house on the rock. And that is the secret of the gospel. That is the, the, the call of the gospel. That's why this man is resting and is at peace. Because he can say, God is my rock. He's my foundation. He knows he's safe because he's standing on this rock. He's building everything upon this rock. Oh, listen to it. My flesh and my heart fail, but God is the strength. No, God is the rock of my heart and my portion forever. Isn't that wonderful? He's arrived at a position, hasn't he? A position of absolute full assurance of salvation. The Lord is his rock. What a picture it is. What a foundation. The Bible says, those who trust in the Lord cannot be shaken. They cannot be moved. Once you're in Christ, you're in Christ forever. You'll find it all the way through the Psalms and all the way through the Bible particularly. And as you come to the New Testament, the same. Let me give you a verse in, in, the, in the prophet Isaiah. In, in Isaiah chapter 9. Uh, sorry, not Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 28. Listen to what God says in Isaiah 28. Therefore the Lord says, Behold, verse 16, I lay in Zion a stone for, for a foundation, 
I lay a foundation, a stone for a foundation. Remember, this is Christ. A tried stone, a precious corner stone. A sure foundation. And that fo sure foundation is Christ. Whoever believes in him, the New Testament says, will not hack hastily, he will not be put to shame. And you have it in the New Testament, quoted in the New Testament, Paul quotes it, well it's quoted in the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 4, Peter quotes it, but I'll quote the Apostle Paul in, Acts chapter, in, in Romans chapter 9. As it is written, he says, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone, he quotes it, a rock of offence, whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. This, this rock, this foundation, is, it's something that will, it is secure and certain if you believe in it. But you can fail. It will crush you if you don't believe in it. It becomes a, a stumbling block to those who don't believe. It's the cornerstone. It's the very thing that holds the foundation and the, the thing together. Everything is upon that. And that's why it's quoted in the Gospels particularly and in the New Testament preaching. No, says Peter, is the salvation in any other. This is a sure foundation. There is no one else. He's the foundation. He's the chief cornerstone. On this rock I'll build my church. Whoever believes in him will never be put to shame. That's the truth of it. It really means they'll never fail. They cannot be uh, disappointed. It will not end. It will not fail. God is my portion forever, he says. Oh, let me close with a hymn. Do you remember? Do you remember these words? Do you remember you're familiar with them? We've, we've, sung, we've sung them a lot in the past year. Do you remember the hymn writer? He says, my hope is built on nothing less. What's your hope built on, friend? Than Jesus, blood and righteousness. Can you see? My hope is built on nothing less then Jesus' blood, his death on the cross, his righteousness, his perfect life. That's what my hope is built on. That's my rock, the gospel of Christ Jesus. The, the rock that's Christ. It's nothing else. And I love what he says next. I dare not trust the sweetest frame. Are you feeling good? Are you feeling pleased with yourself? Are you happy and you're joyful and at peace? Don't rest in that. I, do, I don't even trust that. I wholly leave. On the rock Christ Jesus. I wholly lean on Jesus' name. Holy. Are you, are you entirely resting for your salvation upon Christ? When darkness veils his lovely face. I rest upon his unchanging grace. When God seems distant, not near. I still rest upon his unchanging grace. In every eye and stormy gale. The storms of life that come and batter us. My anchor holds within the veil. How about that? It's holding me. It's keeping me. His oath, his covenant and his blood support me in the whelming flood. His promises, you see, that God that cannot lie has said this. No wonder he says he's my rock. Oh, when all around my soul gives way, listen to this. He then is all my hope and stay. Is Christ your rock? Is he your hope? Is he your strength? Is he your power? Is he your rock? The rock of your heart? Is he your portion forever? Can you say he's my hope in that way? Oh, when he shall come with trumpet sound, the second coming of Christ, or oh, may I then be him in him be found, clothed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. He's my portion forever. What about you? You see, this man knows it, doesn't he? He just knows it. He can say it. He can say, on Christ, the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. My flesh and my heart fail, but God, but God is the strength, the rock of my heart, and he is my portion forever. Isn't it wonderful? Is that you? Have you come to that place? Are you on the rock, the rock of ages? Are you standing on the rock, that solid rock? On Christ, the solid rock, I stand. Can you say that? Everywhere else is hopeless, sinking sand. Oh, can you see his secret? It's a secret, isn't it? He's got it. He does not want or need anything else 
Because God is everything to him. He is fully resting in God. He's fully trusting in God. He is his rock. He is his everything. He is his portion forever. Let me read it all to you. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is none upon earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart fail. But God is the strength of my heart, the rock of my heart, and my portion forever. May God enable us all to be able to say that today. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for that promise of full assurance. Oh, that we might say it today, Lord, on Christ, the solid rock, I stand. We dare not trust anything else but wholly lean. On Jesus' name. May it be so, Lord. May it be so for all of us. May we know the peace and the rest and the assurance that comes from such a position as this man had. May it be our confession, our position, our enjoyment. May we, Lord, be able to say the same today for your glory. Amen. Well, I trust God's word will bless you today and in the days that lie ahead. And you're able to say that you're standing on that rock, Christ Jesus. If you are, then nothing can move you. If you're not, then my message to you is get on that rock. The gospel is to, to, to call you to come to him and to believe upon him. He is the sure foundation. Put your faith in Christ today and you'll be standing on that rock, Christ Jesus. And nothing can shake you once you're on that. God bless you and may he bless his word to you, both today and in the coming days. Amen.
Thank mm-hmm. you.